You're watching the History Fellow Channel. In this video, we're looking at the Battle of Seven Pines. The Battle of Seven Pines, also known as the Battle of Fair Oaks or Fair Oaks Station, took place on May the 31st and June the 1st of 1862 in Henrico County, Virginia, as part of the Peninsula Campaign of the American Civil War. The Union's Army of the Potomac commanded by Major General George B. McClellan, had moved up the Virginia Peninsula, reaching the outskirts of Richmond, the Confederate capital. On May the 31st, Confederate General Joseph E. Johnson attempted to overwhelm two Federal corps that had appeared isolated south of the Chicomi River. The Confederate assaults, although poorly coordinated, succeeded in driving back the four corps and the inflicting heavy casualties. Reinforcements arrived and both sides fed more and more troops into the action. Supported by the Third Corps and Major General John Sedgwick's Division of Major General Edwin V. Sumner's Second Corps, the Federal position was finally stabilised. General Johnson was seriously wounded during the action and the command of the Confederate Army devolved temporarily to Major General G. W. Smith. On June the 1st, the Confederates renewed their assaults against the Federals, who had brought their, their reinforcements, but made little headway. Both sides claimed victory. Although the battle was tactically inconclusive, it was the largest battle in the Eastern Theatre up to that time, and only Shiloh, in terms of casualties thus far, about 11,000 in total. General Johnson's injury also had the profound influence on the war. It led to the appointment of Robert E. Lee as the Confederate commander. The more aggressive Lee initiated the Seven Days Battles, leading to a Union retreat in late June. Seven Pines, therefore, marked the closest Union forces came to Richmond until near the end of the war. Johnson withdrew his 75,000 man army from the Virginia Peninsula as McClellan's army pursued him and approached the Confederate capital of Richmond. Johnson's defensive line began at the James River at Drury's Bluff, site of the recent Confederate naval victory, and extended counterclockwise so that his centre and left were behind the Chicomini River, a natural barrier in the spring when it turned the land to the east of the Richmond into, sun, into swamps. Johnson's men burned most of the bridges over the Chicomini and settled into a strong and defensive position north and east of the city. McClellan positioned his 105-man army to the focus on the northeast sector for two reasons. First, the Pamunkey River, which ran on roughly par parallel to the Chicomini offered a line of defence communication that could enable McClellan to get around Johnson's left flank. Second, McClellan anticipated the arrival of the First Corps under Major General Irwin McDowell, scheduled to march south from Fredericksburg to reinforce his army and thus needed to protect his avenue of approach. The Army of the Potomac pushed slowly up the Pamunkey establishing supply bases at Eltham's Landing, Cumberland Landing and White House Landing. White House, the plantation of WHF Rooney Lee, son of General Robert E. Lee, became McClellan's base of operations, using the Richmond and York River Railroad. McClellan could bring his heavy siege artillery to the outskirts of Richmond. He moved slowly and deliberately, reacting to faulty intelligence, that led him to believe the Confederates outnumbered him significantly. By the end of May, the army had built up a few bridges across the Chicomini and was facing Richmond, straddling the river, with one third of the army south of the river, two thirds north. The Union Army of the Potomac, of 105,000 men, was near the outskirts of Richmond to the northeast, 
straddling the Tacoma River. There were three corps north of the river protecting the Union Railroad supply line. The 5th Corps under Brigadier General Fitz John Porter. The 6th Corps under Brigadier General William B. Franklin and the 2nd Corps under Brigadier General Edwin V. Sumner. South of the river was the 4th Corps under Brigadier General Erasmus D. Keyes in a position far forward and close to the Confederate lines. And the 3rd Corps under Brigadier General Samuel P. Heinz Orman at the start of the battle on May the 31st, McClellan was confined to bed, ill with a flare-up of his chronic malaria. Johnston had 60,000 men in his Army of the North of Virginia, protecting the defensive works of Richmond in eight divisions, commanded by Major General James Longstreet. Major General D.H. Hill, Major General Benjamin Huger, Major General Gustavus Smith, Major General A.P. Hill, Major General John B. Magruder, Brigadier General David Rumpf Jones, and Major General Lafayette McClaws. Just prior to the battle, Johnson appointed Longstreet, Smith, and Magruder as wing commanders. Longstreet had the right wing, consisting of his own division, D.H. Hills and Hugers. Smith had a left wing consisting of his division of A.P. Hills, while Magruder had his division, Jones and McClaws, in the reserve wing. Brigadier General Richard H. Anderson and Brigadier General William H. C. Whiting had operational command of Longstreet and Smith's divisions. Johnson, who had retreated up the peninsula to the outskirts of Richmond, knew that he could not survive a massive siege and decided to attack McClellan. His original plan was to attack the Union right flank north of the Chickamauga River before McDowell's corps marching south from Fredericksburg could arrive. However, on May the 27th, the same day of the Battle of Hanover Courthouse, was fought northeast of Richmond, Johnson learned that McDowell's corps had been diverted to the Shenandoah Valley and would not be reinforced in the Army of the Potomac. He decided against attacking across his own natural defence line, the Chickahominy, and planned to capitalise on the Union's army straddle of the river by attacking the two corps south of the river, leaving them isolated from the other three corps north of the river. If executed correctly, Johnson would engage three corps of his army, which was 22 of his 29 infantry brigades, of around 51,000 men against the 33,000 men in the 3rd and the 4th Corps. The Confederate attack plan was complex, calling for the divisions of A.P. Hill and Magruder to engage lightly and distract the Union forces north of the river, while Longstreet commanding the main attack south of the river was to converge on Keyes from three different directions. Six brigades under Longstreet's immediate command and four brigades under D.H. Hill were to advance on separate roads, a crossroads known as Seven Pines. Three brigades under Huger were assigned to support Hill's right. Whiting's division was to follow Longstreet's column as a reserve. The plan had an excellent, excellent potential for initial success because the division of the four corps Furthest of forward, manning the earthworks at a mile west of Seven Pines, was that of Brigadier General Silas Casey. 6,000 men were the most least, or who were the least experienced and equipped in Key's Corps. If Key's could be defeated, the Third Corps to the east could be pinned against the Chickamauga and overwhelmed. The complex plan was mismanaged from the start, though. Johnson chose to issue his orders to Longstreet orally in a long and rambling meeting on May the 30th. The other generals received written orders that were vague and contradictory. He also failed to notify all the division commanders that Longstreet was in tactical command south of the river. This missing detail 
as a serious oversight because both Huger and Smith technically outranked Longstreet. On Longstreet's part, he neither misunderstood his orders or chose to modify them without informing Johnston. Rather than taking this assigned avenue of advance on the Nine Mile Road, his column joined hills on the Williamsburg Road, which not only delayed the advance, but limited the attack to a narrow front with only a fraction of its total force. Exacerbating the problems on both sides was a severe thunderstorm on the night of May the 30th, which flooded the river, destroyed most of the Union bridges and turned the roads into a morasses of mud. The attack got off to a bad start on May the 31st when Longstreet marched down the Charles City Road and turned into Williamsburg Road instead of the Nine Mile Road. Huger's orders had not specified a time that the attack was scheduled to start and he was not awakened until he'd heard the division nearby. Johnson and his second in command, Smith, unaware of Longstreet's location or Huger's delay, waited at their headquarters for word of the start of the battle. Five hours after the scheduled start at 1pm, D.H. Hill became impatient and sent his brigades forward after Casey's division. Hill's division, some 10,000 men strong, came charging out of the woods. The 181st New York regiments had been placed up front as heavy skirmish lines, and Hill's assault rolled them completely over them. Casey's line, manned by inexperienced troops, buckled, with some men retreating, but fought fiercely for possession of their earthwork. This resulted in heavy casualties on both sides. The Confederates only engaged four brigades of the 13 on their right flank that day, so they did not hit with the power they could have concentrated on a weak point in the Union line. Casey sent a frantic request for help, but Keyes was slow in responding. Eventually the mass of Confederates broke through, seized the Union redoubt, and Casey's men retreated to the second line of defensive works at Seven Pines. During this period, both the high commanders were unaware of the severity of the battle. As late as 2.30, Heinzelman reported to McClellan, still sick in his bed, that he had received no word from Keyes. Johnston was only two and a half miles from the front, but an acoustic shadow prevented him from hearing the sounds of cannons and mus musketry. He and his staff did not know about the battle, or knew it had begun until four o'clock. Hill, whose four brigades had been fighting alone for almost four hours, sent a message to Longstreet requesting reinforcements, but Longstreet sent forward only Richard Anderson's brigade. Brigadier General Robert Rhodes went down wounded in the desperate fighting around Seven Pines. Colonel G. B. Gordon of the 6th Alabama, a future Major General, took over command of Rhodes' brigade. Most of the officers in the 6th Alabama went down, although Gordon himself survived the battle without any injury, despite his clothing and canteen being pierced by several bullets. Gordon also glimpsed his 19-year-old brother Augustus, a captain in the regiment, lying among the pile of dead and dying men with a chest wound, but with the battle raging, had no time to stop and tend to him. Rhodes' brigade in total lost more than 50% of its strength. Also wounded was Brigadier General Gabriel Rains, a few days shy of his 59th birthday and one of the oldest officers in the Army of the Northern Virginia. Command of his brigade devolved on Colonel Alfred Colquitt of the 6th Georgia, who would eventually be appointed permanent commander of the brigade. The Army of the Potomac was accompanied by the Union Army Balloon Corps, commanded by Professor Thaddeus S. C. Lowe, who had established two balloon camps on the north side of the river, one at Gaines's farm and one at Mechanicsville. Lowe reported on May the 29th a build-up of Confederate forces to the left of Newbridge 
and the front of Fair Oaks train station. The constant rain on May the 30th and heavy winds in the morning of May the 31st, the aerostats, Washington and Intrepid, did not launch until noon. Low observed Confederate troops moving in battle formation and this information was relayed verbally to McClellan's headquarters by two o'clock. Lowe continued to send reports on the Intrepid via telegraph the remainder of May the 31st. On June the 1st, Lowe reported that the Confederate attacks to the left of Richmond as being free from smoke. McClellan did not follow up on this information with a counter-attack by his corps north of the Chickamauga River. Around one o'clock, Hill, now strengthened by the arrival of Richard Anderson's brigade, hit the secondary Union line near Seven Pines, which was manned by the remnants of Casey's division. The four corps division of Brigadier General Darius N. Couch and Brigadier General Philip Kearney's division from Heights Allman's Third Corps. Hill organised a flanking manoeuvre, sending four regiments under Colonel Micaiah Jenkins from Longstreet's command to attack Keyes' right flank. The attack collapsed the Federal line back to the Williamsburg Road, a mile and a half beyond Seven Pines. Meanwhile, another of Longstreet's brigades under Colonel James L. Kemper arrived on the field and charged the Union lines, but artillery fire forced them to retreat. The fighting in that part of the line died out to about 7.30. During the evening, Longstreet himself arrived on the field along with the remaining four brigades of his division, as well as the three brigades of Huger's division. On the Union side, Brigadier General Israel Richardson's division of the 2nd Corps arrived on the field along with Joe Hooker's division of the 3rd Corps. Just before Hill's attack began, Johnson received a note at approximately 4 o'clock from Longstreet requesting that he join the battle and the first news he had of, heard of the fighting. Johnson went forward on the 9 mile road with the 5 Brigade Division led by Brigadier General William Chase Whiting. Hours earlier that day, Whiting had been elevated into command of Major General Gustavus Smith's division. As the lead regiment of the division, led by Colonel Dorsey Pender, 6th North Carolina, reached the North Railroad crossing artillery guns opened on Pender's advance. This opened the segment of the Battle of the Seven Pines to be known as the Battle of Fair Oaks Station. The guns were part of Brigadier General John Abercrombie's brigade of Couch's division, and they began to put up a stiff resistance. Whiting advanced his former brigade, commanded by Colonel Evander Law, to attack the Union artillery off to his left, but was stopped by Abercrombie's brigade and his four artillery pieces. Meanwhile, the commander of the Second Corps, Brigadier General Edwin V. Sumner, brought his command into action from its entrenchments north of the Chickahominy. When told, his, when told the crossing, the, sorry, when told that the crossing, the rain swollen river, was impossible, Sumner replied, impossible? Sir, I'll tell you I can cross. I am ordered. The first Second Corps Brigade to arrive on the field was Brigadier General. Willis Gorman's brigade of Br Brigadier General John Sedgwick's division, which contacted the attack of Colonel Evander Law's brigade. Law's attack was initiated by Colonel William Dorsey Pender of the 6th North Carolina and was later assisted by the brig brigades of Brigadier General John, Brigadier General J. Johnston Pettigrew and Colonel Wade Hampton III. The three brigades experienced no success as Sumner brought forth his two additional brigades and another, of, another battery of artillery from Sedgwick's division. During the final attack, Confederate Brigade General Robert Hatton, one of the Army of Virginia's newest brigadiers, 
having just been promoted from Colonel of the 7th Tennessee on May the 23rd, was shot in the head, leading his brigade into action, and died instantly. Hampton, meanwhile, was shot in the angle. Brigadier General J. Johnson Pettigrew was gravely wounded and left for dead on the field, later being taken prisoner by Cedric's division. The repeated assaults on Cedric's line was unsuccessful, as the latter's artillery also pounded Whiting's troops, who had no artillery to answer back. A final surge by Whiting's four brigades resulted in a heavy loss of casualties as some them mounted a counterattack that drove the Confederate force from the field. It was after this counterattack that Pettigrew was discovered and sent to a Union field hospital for the care of his wounds. Shortly after Sumner's counterattack, Johnson received two wounds and was removed from the field. Command of the Army transferred to Major General Gustavus Smith. With darkness approaching, over, tw- over 1,200 casualties and most of his officers killed or wounded, Whiting called off the attacks. Sedgwick's Sedru- division had lost m- less than 400 men. Two of Magruder's brigades reached the field at dusk, but had no involvement in any of the fighting. Whiting's 5th Brigade, the famous Texas Brigade of Brigadier General John B. Hood, had not fought either. It had been sent off to reinforce Longstreet and was stationed in the woods some distance to the west of Fair Oak Station. The most historically significant incident of the day occurred around dusk when Johnson was struck in the right shoulder by a bullet, immediately followed by a shell fragment hitting him in the chest. He fell unconscious from his horse with a broken right shoulder blade and two broken ribs and was evacuated to Richmond. G.W. Smith assumed temporary command of the army. Smith, plagued with ill health, was indecisive about the next steps to the battle and made a bad impression. And Confederate President Jefferson Davis and General Robert E. Lee, Davis's military advisor. After the end of the fight in the following day, Davis replaced Smith with Lee as commander of the Army of the Northern Virginia. During the night of May the 31st and June the 1st, scouts in Israeli Richardson's division reported two Confederate regiments camped only about 100 yards away. Richardson declined to make a risky night attack, but had his troops form a line of battle just in case. By daybreak, however, the enemy regiments had withdrawn from their exposed positions. At 6.30am, the Confederates resumed their attacks. Two of Huger's three brigades, commanded by Brigadier Generals William Mahoney and Lewis Armistead, assaulted Richardson's division and momentarily drove part of it back, but Richardson's men rallied. They were reinforced by Brigadier General David B. Burney's brigade of Kearney's division, which had not been engaged the previous day as Burney, had accidentally taken the wrong road and gotten lost. He was arrested by Heintzelman for disobeying orders, and the brigade was temporarily commanded by Colonel J. H. Hobbit Ward, of the 38th New York. After fierce fighting, Huger's division was forced to retreat. In his official report of the battle, Mahone stated his casualties at 338 men. Armistead's report did not give a casualty figure, but his losses were undoubtedly heavy as well. On the Union side, Total losses in Richardson and Burney's outfits outnumbered nine hundred numbered nine hundred and forty eight men, including Brigadier General Oliver O. Howard, whose right arm was shattered by a mini ball, necessitating an amputation that kept Howard out of action for months. Approximately sixty percent of Richardson's total casualties came from Howard's brigade. Pickett's brigade to the right of Armistead, had lost 350 men. To the south, the brigades of Roger Pryor and Cadmus Wilcox 
were attacked by Hooker's division. Although both brigades resisted stubbornly, the order was given to retreat, which they did with some reluctance. By mid-morning, the Confederates withdrew to Casey's earthworks, west of Seven Pines, and the fighting ended. Both sides claimed victory with roughly equal casualties, but neither side's accomplishment was impressive. George B. McClellan's advance on Richmond was halted, and the Army of Northern Virginia fell back into the Richmond defensive work. Union casualties were 5,031, and Confederate 6,134, making it the second largest and bloodiest battle of the year to date after Shiloh, eight weeks earlier. The battle was frequently remembered by the Union soldiers as the Battle of Fair Oaks Station, because that is where they did their best fighting. <coughs> Whereas the Confederates, for the same reason, called it Seven Pines. Historian Stephen W. Sears remarked that, that its current common name, Seven Pines, is the most appropriate because it was at the crossroads of Seven Pines that the heaviest fighting and highest casualties were occurred. A contemporary map drawn by Private Julius Honor Bale of the 5th Alabama Infantry Regiment refers simply to the engagement as having occurred at the battlefield of the 31st of May and the 1st of June, 62. Despite claiming victory, McClellan was shaken by the experience. He wrote to his wife, I'm tired of the sickening sight of the battlefield, with its mangled corpses and poor suffering wounded. Victory is no chance for me when purchased at such a cost. He redeployed all of his army except for the 5th Corps south of the river, and although he continued to pan for a siege of the capture of Richmond, he lost the strategic initiative. Casey's division was unjustly blamed for the near disaster, and McClellan had Casey removed from command. The hapless division would play no further role in the campaign, being relegated to guard duty at Harrison's Landing along the James River, and was left behind permanently on the peninsula after the Army of the Potomac returned to Washington, D.C. in early August. An offensive began and the new Confederate commander, General Robert T. Lee, would be planned while the Union troops passively sat in the outskirts of Richmond. The Seven Days Battles of June 25th through to the July 1st of 1862 drove the Union back to the James River and saved the Confederate capital. After taking command, Robert E. Lee embarked on a reorganisation of the Confederate Army, breaking up and reassigning some brigades, nominating replacements for dead and wounded officers, and removing two brigadiers, Albert G. Blanchard and Raleigh Colston, who had failed to get their units into action during the battle and generally delivered a below average performance. The change in leadership of the Confederate Army in the field as a result of Seven Pines, had a profound effect on the war. On June 24, 1862, McClellan's massive army of the Potomac was within six miles of the Confederate capital of Richmond. <coughs> Union soldiers wrote that they could hear church bells ringing in the city. Within 90 days, however, Robert E. Lee had driven McClellan from the peninsula Pope had been soundly beaten at the Battle of, or the Second Battle of Bull Run, and the battle lines were 20 miles from the Union capital in Washington. It would take almost two more years before the Union Army again got back close to Richmond, and almost three years before it finally captured it. I hope the information in this video has been informative or helpful. Thank you very much for watching and listening to this video. If you've enjoyed it, please feel free to give the video a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you very much.